We're going to see uh, here in Matthew chapter 6 today, uh, Jesus refers to the birds of the air. Uh, he, he tells us to learn something from them. And so uh, we're going we're gonna to be talking about that. Um, and uh, uh, so if you guys want to go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6 uh, and check that, uh, or go ahead and turn there, that'd be great. Uh, my name is Josh Hallett. I'm the community pastor here. Uh, help oversee small groups, uh, Compassion Ministries, um, and a few other things. And uh, Danny's out on study leave right now, and he's basically just trying to determine uh, what the vision of our church is, and he'll bring that uh, kind of back, and the elders will really wrestle with, you know, where do we go from here. And so if you would, just be praying for him as, as he's uh, just, uh, you know, uh, seeking God on our behalf uh, uh, this week. So um, Jenny and I, uh, my wife and I, we were at REI. We got any REI fans out there? Yeah, you know who you are. You're ashamed of yourselves. We were too. We were standing there in REI and we were looking at, we were looking at it. It was, they had them in red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet too. Every color. They had knobby tires, they had smooth tires, they had shocks, they had pretty much like everything you were looking for in a stroller. <laughs> we had just had our firstborn and, and we needed a stroller that could do more than the average stroller. I mean, our friends had them, you know. Uh, we needed a stroller that could go off road, go over roots, go over trees, rocks, rivers, whatever. And we were up there, we were looking at it, man, and we were just dialed into this thing and we wanted it bad. You know, but as we were thinking about it, you know, I don't know if it was the price tag. I mean, 400 bucks is kind of a lot for a stroller uh, or the way that we wanted it so bad in that moment. But, but there was something that was a little bit off in that moment to where we were like, oh, man, I don't know about this. And so we, we took a little while and we said, you know, let's just take this, let's just take this, let's pray about it, let's just see what God wants. And we became convinced that, man, that wasn't the thing for that moment. Like we weren't supposed to, to go after that thing, that moment. And it was, uh, you know, a couple days later, not, not too long after that, that we, uh, that I was out on a bike ride and I'm riding down Swiss Avenue in Dallas, Texas. And uh, as I'm going down the road, I look out to my right and there's this yard sale. And right in the back of this thing is this bright orange Bob stroller. So I just throw my bike down, go tearing through the yard sale, terrify people. Like, that's my stroller. You know, how much do you want for this thing? And they're like, 100 bucks. No way. No way. We'll take it. And it was just the coolest little way that God provided for us. And since then, we've, we've put like two, three, four thousand 4,000 miles on this thing. It's been up hills. It's been down mountains. It's been through rivers. It's been off curbs. Like we've had to rewrap the handle or the bar on this thing. It's been, it's been, we've had six kids on it at one time. It's a double stroller. Um, but it was really awesome how uh, God provided in that moment. Uh, see, we all, we all have things that we want right? Um, I mean, I have all sorts of material things that I, I desire or I treasure, things, you know, okay, I want, want a new bike or a new car, or a new home, new, you know, fill in the blank. We all have those things that we desire or, or maybe something immaterial like, man, I just, I just want the approval of this person or I just want that promotion or just want him to listen to me. You know, we all have things that we want. But the question that that kind of lingers in the back of our minds and sometimes all too uh, quiet is the question of, man, in this moment, with this thing, with this decision, do I treasure, do I want the same things that God wants for my life? Or do I want something more than what he wants? We're going to be uh, looking at Matthew chapter 6 here, and, and the question we want to ask is, man, how can I begin to treasure what God treasures? I know what I treasure, but how can I begin to treasure what God treasures? Because he's the only one who's wise. He's the one who created everything beautiful in this world. He's the one who created mountains and rivers and streams. Uh, he's the one who uh, created the birds of the air, the flowers of the field. He feeds them. He cares for them. He's, he's made everything beautiful. 
And so when it comes down to me deciding what should I treasure, man, I, I think I should probably treasure what he treasures. He's the one who's all wise, all knowing, um, and can see what's worth treasuring. Um, we're going to look uh, here, um, and we're going to ask the question, how do we treasure what God treasures? Uh, but there's, a, there's kind of another question. If I begin to uh, treasure what God treasures, will I have enough dot, dot, dot of what I treasure? You know what I'm saying? That's kind of the question always lingering in the back. Okay, God, if I trust you and I, if I do the thing that I think you're asking me to do, like what about the desires of my heart? What about the things that I enjoy? And so we're going to wrestle with those two questions. First thing uh, that we want to do is just ask this question. How do, treasure, how do I treasure what God treasures? Well, the first thing is this. Let's determine what we treasure. Determine what we treasure. Uh, if you look at uh, verse 19 here, Jesus says this. He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I remember we were living at seminary and Jenny used to always tell me like, just don't lock the door. And I'd always refer back to this verse. Jesus said, thieves break in and steal, babe. I think we should probably lock the door. Um, determine what you treasure. If I was going to try to determine what I treasured, uh, maybe, maybe one of the things that I'd uh, begin to ask is, you know, what would I love to store up? Jesus talked about storing up here, and he actually uses the word later on down the passage about the birds of the air, how they don't store up, they don't gather into barns. But what, what is there out there that, man, I just love to store this up? And uh, I'm always kind of, you know, throwing the idea out there to Jenny of, hey, would you like to, you know, just move to Hawaii? I, I know we'd have to live in a tent because we probably couldn't afford to be there, but it'd be worth it because I'd love to just store up adventure. And, and that is adventure central, right? You know, they have waves, they have mounds, they have rivers. You can do, you know, if you're an adventure junkie, you, you have so much of what you'd love to have. <clears throat> what about you? Uh, what would you love to store up? Uh, what might you go too far to get? Uh, one mom told me <clears throat> kind of how she was uh, considering crossing maybe like an ethical line because she wanted so bad to get her kid uh, in, in the best schools. Like she, man, if I could store up anything, it'd be this safe environment for my kid and I'll do anything to get as much of that as possible. Um, and yet she was convicted by a talk that they had in Thrive, which was like, man, don't, don't make it your main ambition to store up safety and protection for your kids. Like there has to be this element of faith in there. Uh, what might you say, uh, how, how might you complete uh, these two little phrases? Life only has meaning, I only have worth if. Uh, we have a few slides here that highlight a couple things. Life only has meaning, I only have worth if. I have power and influence over others. Power, I'm trying to store that up. Uh, I'm loved and respected by uh, approval. I have this uh, kind of pleasure or experience, uh, comfort. I'm able to get mastery over my life in the area of X, control. Um, maybe it's independence. I have a high, I'm highly productive and I get a lot of work done. Life only has meaning. When I work, 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 achieve, achieve, achieve. Um, a couple guys in my group were telling me they, you know, try to get these projects done at home and, uh, <laughs> and the kids keep interrupting them. Like, just, just leave me alone and come back when you're 20, 30, you know. <laughs> just let me paint the house. Um, life only has meaning, only have worth. If I have a level of wealth or financial freedom, very nice possessions, um, material. What do you love to store up? Um, maybe you just want the, the approval of an individual person or uh, the whole idea of, man, uh, good, like, I just want our family to be so, like, just this warm place, and we invest, 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 invest in family. Um, um, the idea of having uh, Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright, 
or, uh, or our bodies look in a certain way, a certain image. If we're going to make sure that we treasure what God treasures, uh, we, we need to kind of zero in on, man, what do I treasure? Um, ask this question, uh, what do you treasure? Kind of get in your head. Um, what is it that you love to store up? All these things are good things. They're all good things. Don't get me wrong. They're all good things. Um, one quote uh, that I wanted to show you guys uh, was from uh, John Eldridge here. And just before we get too far into uh, the message, I just want to say that that desire for good things is not necessarily bad. Um, desire is a good thing. Uh, Eldridge says this. He says, uh, sometimes it seems like we just can't get what we want. Circumstances thwart our best laid plans. We struggle to live a heartfelt life. And worst of all, says Eldridge, the modern church mistakenly teaches its people to kill desire, calling it sin, <clears throat> and replace it with duty or obligation, calling it sanctification. As a result, at best, Christians tend to live safe, boring lives of resignation. And y'all, as we just focus in on kind of what we treasure, I just want to... Um, repeat what Eldred says there and, and just say, man, I don't think God wants us to do away with all desire for good things. The Bible says he's given us every good thing uh, to enjoy. But when a good thing becomes a ruling thing that displaces God from our hearts, that's, that's what we're talking about here. So how do we determine if the things that we treasure uh, are, are kind of this ruling thing that I mentioned? Oh, the second thing is this, uh, we need to determine if it's treason. How do we treasure what God's tre God treasures? Well, we need to determine what we treasure. The second thing is this, determine if it's treason. Again, God's not against desire. Remember Psalm 37, four, it says, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you what? This is the desires of your heart. But where's your focus? Delight yourself in the, it's not on the desires of your heart. It's delighting yourself in the Lord. Determine if it's treason. Um, determine if it's treason. Uh, let's look at the text here. It's verse 22. It says, uh, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and love the other. You cannot serve God and money. I asked Chuck to pick for me what I would be preaching on. He said, do you want to pick the topic yourself or you want me to pick it for you? And he picked this one. I'm like, thanks, Chuck. Man, that's a pretty tough passage you gave me here. But then it was so cool the last two weeks as we're doing our small group study. It's actually on this passage. For the last two weeks, that's what we were up to do. Matthew chapter 6. And, and, and I just, I just kind of think that God has something to say here. He has something to work on us on. We had picked our compassion theme of more than enough months ago. And then as I'm looking at this passage, that's all that it's about. It's like, don't, don't be trying to get more than enough for yourself. Jesus is more than enough. No one can serve two masters. So we determine if it's treason. Determine if it's treason. Well, uh, how do you determine uh, something is treason? It says here in the text, it says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. I, I never really kind of figured out what this passage is talking about in the past. It just kind of skimmed over. I actually thought about leaving it out of the message. And I'm like, I have no idea what this is talking about. Um, but then as I read a couple of commentaries, uh, it, it just pointed to this idea that, okay, if, if somebody has, um, you know, bad vision, right? There's not, it, your, your eye's only going to let so much light in, Right? If you have good vision, it, it lets more light in, uh, and you can see the images more clearly. The commentator said this, the primary focus here is on what you're giving attention to, right? What your eyes are looking at. I, uh, I was on Facebook the other night, and I'm kind of scrolling down, and this ad pops up, and it's for this van 
that is just set up for adventure. I mean, it shows pictures of these kids like playing quietly in the back, so well behaved, uh, while the parents are out enjoying a campfire. And you know, they have these little lights so that they can read probably the Bible or something. This band looked very magical, you know, and. And I'm looking at this thing, I'm like, man, that's exactly what I want, you know? And I I couldn't believe it, but I mean, Facebook somehow through, you know, maybe being in touch with the different web pages that I go to, whether it's National Geographic or Adventure or, you know, Red Bull TV or whatever, all these different websites. I mean, they've kind of got me dialed in. They know what I fix my eyes on. They know what I give attention to. Um, We have a guy in our small group and he actually works with these companies to help you, you know, zero in. They try to figure out how to, uh, there you are. Um, They (laughs) try to figure out how to best market to you. You need to quit doing that, you know? And um, anyhow, they, you know, try to figure out how to best, I'm like, man, they know exactly what I give my attention to. And so as you think about, man, what is it that I treasure? Well, where are your eyes constantly? What are you constantly looking at? What are you constantly giving attention to? Um, uh, who's the audience that Jesus is talking to here in Matthew 6? Uh, he, he's uh, again and again just uh, talking, he's talking to this broad crowd, but there's kind of these people hanging off to the side. And he keeps kind of rebuking them. If you see beginning, uh, in the beginning of the chapter, he's talking about, man, how these people pray. They always pray in public. How these people give. Um, he's, he's talking about uh, how they fast. And he's just saying, the hypocrites fast like this. The hypocrites give like, the hypocrites pray like this. And then he gets to this passage, he's like, this is how the hypocrites deal with treasure. And he says of the Pharisees, he says, The Pharisees believed the Lord materially blessed all that he loved. They were intent on building great treasures on earth, and with their eyes they were coveting, with their eyes they were coveting money and wealth. They were slaves to the master of greed, and their desire for money was so great they were failing in their service to their true master, God. Their eyes had shifted from God to the wealth of this world, and they were ruled by it. You're either ruled by uh, what you, you're ruled by what you treasure. And at some point, if you're treasuring something other than God, it becomes treason. Treason is the crime of betraying one's own country, especially by attempting to kill the sovereign or overthrow the government. I love that song that we sang this morning, um, Jesus is Better. I love the verse where it says, your kindly rule has shattered and broken the curse of sin's tyranny. Um, how do I determine if my treasure is treason? Well, is it trying to, is it trying to take control of me? Is it something that uh, just... Uh, Um, dominates my thoughts? Is it something that dominates my time? Is it something that I give myself to fully? Is it something that I serve? Does it rule me? Do I pay attention to it? Um, Do I give attention? Do I stand at attention to it? Paul Tripp, uh, this was in our small group study over the past couple weeks on, on marriage. He says, a desire for even a good thing becomes a bad thing when that desire becomes a ruling thing. What do you treasure? What do you want? Are you ruled by it? Does it take all your time, all your energy, all your thoughts, all your emotions? A.W. Tozer says this. He says, the roots of our hearts have grown down into things, and we dare not pull up one rootlet lest we die. Things have become necessary to us, a development never originally intended. God's gifts now take the place of God. And the whole course of nature is upset by the monstrous substitution. So what do you do if you get to a place where you're like, man, okay, as you're talking, and I'm, I'm kind of just processing what, you know, what I treasure, what I care about. You know, as I kind of look back over the last two weeks and I think, man, what have I given myself to? Uh, what, what am I running after? Uh, what do I do? Uh, how do I check and see? Man, is that just treasure? Is that just a good desire? Or is this like a good desire that is just out of control? Um, maybe something that, uh, that, that God just like would want to put in check in my life. Um, 
that idea of putting something in check. It, it reminds me of uh, traveling uh, and the whole security process at the, at the airport, right? So, you know, you show up to security and, you know, you're kind of reflective of like, okay, what do I have on my body? You know, like, what do I have with me? What's in my bag, you know? Uh, and, and you're taking out anything that's over six ounces, you know, you're um, just kind of, you know, thinking through what you have, pull your laptop out, take your shoes off, um, take your belt off, take your earrings off, all that kind of stuff. Uh, walk through where thousands of people have walked with bare feet, you know, and just kind of like, just processing, like what, what's on me? Is there anything on me that I take from my kingdom of self that doesn't belong in the kingdom of TSA? You know, like uh, transportation safety, so whatever, I forget what it's called. Um, but uh, anything on me that doesn't belong there. And so we're kind of processing through and you, you know, empty that out. And, and, and then you walk through the metal detector and, you know, if there's something on you that doesn't belong there, it, you know, it beeps and then you go over and then it's kind of this whole deal, okay? Um, and uh, cracks me up every time we're traveling we get up to the, you know, to the point there, my wife, Jenny, bless her, but every single time we get up there, every single time she has her little water bottle and it's completely filled to the top without fail. And so she has to chug the whole thing right there. It's my favorite part of traveling. Just go, 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 you know, and, uh, but, but I think that's kind of how our hearts are sometimes. Like when, like, Jesus, I want to live for your kingdom. I want to be all about what you're about. Like if there's anything in my life that doesn't belong in the kingdom of God where you rule, where you reign, where it's all about you, take it out of my life. And then, by the way, I'm trying to sneak this in in my bag. Like adventure or power or approval or whatever it is, all these possessions, try to sneak them into the kingdom. And he's like, I'm going to rule there. And I'm going to rule alone. And if you got something that doesn't belong here, check it. What's the way that we do that in the church? Uh, well, one good way is kind of like uh, prayer, where we're reflectively beforehand. It's like, okay, God, is there anything in my life that's not under your sovereign control? right now? Is there anything, uh, any decisions that I'm making where I'm just like, man, that's a no-brainer. I'm just going to make that decision. Anything that I'm kind of unwilling to submit to God and say, you know what, man, they just offered me this awesome promotion at work. Man, that's a no-brainer. Just take it. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Like, is that what you want? You're the sovereign. You're the king. I know that's going to take more time, more energy. I'm going to have to bring my laptop home, work on the weekends. Uh, may have to cut back on some commitments that I've already. Like, is that what you want? You're the king. I'm listening to you. Another way we could check that is kind of in our small group settings uh, with, with people who you've begun to trust, who kind of know your life. Just bouncing it off of them and saying, hey, you guys, like, I don't want to waste my life living for the kingdom of Josh. <laughs> I want to live for the kingdom of God. Does this sound like, does this sound like something the king would just put his stamp of approval on? Or does this sound like me just trying to get more of what I want, what I treasure, what I desire? And bouncing it off of those folks, just be like, okay, just hit me with it. Just be honest. And those people can literally save our lives from being wasted on things that won't last for eternity. So we ask the question, okay, that's, that's great. Uh, that's great. The idea of, of doing that. But why would I do that? Why would I do that? Why would I exchange some of my deepest desires for God's desires, the whole idea of seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. Why would I do that? Well, let's just look at verse 25 here. I think we're going to see that Jesus teaches us, kind of third blank is determined to trust. <clears throat> it says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. 
But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble." What Jesus is getting at here, he kind of steps it up a little bit. He's just been talking about treasure and about not anxiously running after treasure. But then he takes it to a whole new level and he's talking about need. He's like, even in the area of need, don't anxiously run after those things. He's talking about clothing and food. And and so he totally steps it up. I mean, we're all, I I mean, this is America. We have so much blessing around us. We have ads coming at us from every angle. We have everything we need within five minutes of here. And and it's so easy to just kind of go out and get whatever we want. Jesus is saying, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious about what you need. Don't be anxious about running after your treasures. That idea of being anxious or concerned or caring about, um, uh, the idea of it dominating my thoughts and time, uh, it's the same word that was used in Luke chapter 10, uh, verses 41 through 42 there, where he's talking about uh, Martha. Remember Mary and Martha? Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet, but Martha was anxiously concerned about many things. She was just running around like, you know, just, just her mind, her eyes were on everything else that needed done. And she completely took her eyes off of Jesus. And Jesus says, you are anxious and worried about many things, but only one thing is necessary. Um, Mary has, has been about the better portion of, like her eyes were fixed on Jesus, not on all the treasures of the world, not on all of her needs, but she focused in on Jesus. He goes a little further and <clears throat> he talks about the, the lilies of the field, or he talks about the birds um, of the air. Wasn't that really nice uh, today when you were uh, coming into church? Man, those birds, they're, they're happy out there. I'd recommend maybe over the coming months, uh, you know, really actually do what Jesus says. Look at the birds of the air. Look at the flowers of the field. I mean, there's something to be learned there. Um, He says to look at them. Um, He says, they don't uh, store up in barns. Look at the birds. Here it is, verse uh, 26. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? He's given two examples here. He gives the example of the birds of the air. Uh, this is for uh, the men who are out working in the field. Here, yeah, here's the Texas version of that passage. You got a grackle and some blue bonnets, okay? If Jesus was here in Texas, there would be a grackle, there would be some blue bonnets, probably some brisket too. Um, but um, uh, he, says, uh, he says to the men who are out working in the fields, uh, he says, look at the birds of the air. They don't, they don't sow, they don't reap. That's what the men were doing out there. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. He goes on and he talks about the lilies of the field. Uh, he says, they don't toil, they don't spin. This is what the, the ladies who are inside making clothing, uh, th- this is what they're doing. He says, look at them. Uh, and yet your heavenly father clothes them. What Jesus is trying to eliminate here is not work, because the Bible tells us to work hard with our hands so that we can share with those in need. The Bible says to whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Uh, We're told again and again to work hard, to work hard, to work hard. What he's getting at here is when I am anxiously toiling after something, that I'm looking to for ultimate life, whether it's the approval given by a boss, whether it's um, you know, affection given by a spouse, whether it's a treasure that I so long for and desire that I'm looking for to kind of fill me up in this way. And Jesus says, don't anxiously run after those things. Trust me for your deepest desires and trust me for your most pressing needs. 
He doesn't say quit working. He says, trust me. He says, trust me. See here, he says this. He says, oh, you of little faith. Oh, you of little faith. The number one thing that Jesus treasures, um, one of the highest priorities on his list is faith. Hebrews 11 says what? Without faith. It's impossible to please God. Jesus is speaking here into the lives of people who are running hard uh, after the things that they need. They're running hard after the things that they want. And he says, you of little faith, I know what you need. I care for you. Look at the birds of the air, that little song that bird sang. That's, That's a bird who knows he's loved. Jesus cares for you. The idea of trust and faith. Um, uh, Peter, Peter says this in 1 Peter. He talks about your faith, which God often uses trials to refine, often takes us through some very hard things. He says your faith is of greater worth than gold. And, and it's so hard for us to keep that in mind. Your faith is of greater worth than gold. Uh, This idea of faith or trust, um, when I trust somebody, that declares that I think that they have my good in mind. Uh, The other night I I came home and Jenny had made me like 10 bacon wrapped jalapenos. Another thing I love about Texas, bacon wrapped jalapenos with the cream cheese inside. You know what I'm talking about? Can I get an amen? Amen. Okay. And the nice thing was that nobody else in the house could eat them because they were too spicy. And so I had way more than enough of those jalapenos. And, but, but the fact that she made those for me, it did something in my heart. I'm like, man, she really cares about me. She thought of me. Like, she had my interest in mind when she did that. And it just made me want to do something, you know, for her as well. And I haven't done it yet. <laughs> but I want to. I want to. When we can get to a place where we believe that God cares for us, where he's no longer, where we're no longer just striving and straining after, I want this, I want this, I need this, I need this. But even in our place of deepest need, even in our place where we're like, Jesus, I'm not seeing how you're gonna provide for me in this moment, but I am just gonna keep trusting you in this hard time because I trust that you are a God who has my need in mind and that you will give me everything that I need to accomplish your purposes for my life. And that's the kicker, right? We always want, I always want more than what I need to, than, than I need to do the will of God. I honestly believe if honestly believe God equips us to do exactly what he wants us to do. And that if he has a plan for your life, uh, he will give you just what you need in order to be able to carry out his good purposes for you. And as you are carrying out his good purposes for you, you will find that the deepest desires of your heart are met in following Jesus wholeheartedly with nothing else ruling on the throne of your heart. Paul says this in Philippians chapter four. He says, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And then in verse 19, he says this, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He went through some some trying times. But Paul was on mission with God. The guy was fully alive in Christ. I think he was having a good time. I think he was enjoying following Jesus. I think he was just wired and built to do the thing that we see him doing throughout the New Testament of planting churches, of blowing up the scene, uh, of proclaiming the gospel. And he was just having fun a fantastic time doing that through persecution, whatever. And he's like, man, I've been through ups and downs, but God has provided. I'm still here. I'm breathing. I'm on mission. It feels good. My heart is beating loud and clear. 
And I think that's where we want to be as a church. This idea of faith, trusting that somebody has my good in mind. Here, uh, Jesus, um, you know, he's talking about the flowers of the field. He's talking about the birds of the air. Uh, He's talking about being cared for, um, them being cared for. When When I see that somebody's caring for me, like when Jenny made those things for me the other night, like I just wanted to care for her, like her interest, you know? I think the same thing's true of God. When, when we see, when we catch a glimpse of the deep love of God, maybe evidenced by his son, Romans 8, 32, he who did not spare his own son, uh, but willingly gave him up for you, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? When we catch a glimpse of the deep love of God for us, like, you're really caring for me in that way? Like, you really care for my deepest heart? You really provided that stroller? For, that was awesome. Like you, like, you blessed me that way? Like, I just want to be about his interest now. now. Now, let me do something that will bless you. God, what will bless you? What, I mean, what would be something that would just minister to your heart? And I'm just kind of thinking, like, how could I bless the heart of God? How could I bless the heart of God? I think that's what it looks like to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. It's like, man, I just want to be about what you're about, God. No, I just want to, I just want to bless your heart, Josh. I just want to bless your heart, God. I just want to, you know, what if you were in a marriage that was like that where you were constantly thinking about your spouse? Man, I just want to do what you care about. Like, where do you want to go today? What do you want to do today? What do you want to, you know? Like, what would happen in that relationship? You would have two people who are just, living in blessing because they're about the desires of the other. Man, I think, I think that's where God wants us to be. God, what do you want me to do today? Where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to talk to? I just want to be about what you care about. We are focusing on our compassion ministries um, right now, and uh, it just reminds me of a few of the things that God cares about. Um, uh, when we have faith that God cares for us, we want to care for what God cares for. Um, Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. When we survey the scriptures and, and just kind of wrestle with what does God care about, again and again and again and again it pops up throughout the scriptures that God cares for those in need. Again, that's what we're talking about today. He wants to provide for people in need. You and me, he cares about it. He cares about the fatherless. He cares about the elderly. He cares about the needy. He cares about the single woman. And our world has left people in, in kind of messed up situations because we all, like the global system has come to a place where so many people saying, I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. We've carved out huge portions of our planet that are in deep need. Um, and so God says, join with me in meeting the needs of the fatherless, the elderly, the needy, the single woman. James says this, he says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. What else does God treasure? Uh, If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom as the noonday. In other words, what are some of the interests? Not all, there's, there's more some of the interest of the kingdom of God. Big part of it is our four main emphasis of our compassion ministries, which we'll be focusing on over the coming weeks of caring for the fatherless, the elderly, the needy, the single woman. How do we begin to treasure what God treasures? We need to determine our treasure. Determine if it's treason and determine to trust. Because it's, when we get to that place of trust, that we can take our eyes off of all of my wants, all of my needs, all of my desires, we can take our eyes off of ourselves and say, God, I really need you to come through for me in the area of my needs. I really need you to provide for me in my area of my desires because I'm gonna be all about your kingdom instead of my kingdom. And if I do that, 
I need you watching my back. I need you to care for, for the deepest needs in my life. God, I'm taking this step of faith and saying, I'm gonna be about your interest. I need you to come through for me. That's faith. God treasures that. As the worship team comes up, I just wanna read this prayer together. Um, if you guys wanna go ahead and stand with me, we'll, we'll actually read this uh, together out loud. It's a prayer from A.W. Tozer's book, The uh, Pursuit of God. Uh, it's the second chapter called The Blessedness of Possessing Nothing. Um, and let's just uh, read this together. It's the prayer that summarizes the chapter. It says, Father, I want to know thee. And you guys can read out loud with me. Let's go here. Father, I want to know thee, but my coward heart fears to give up its toys. I cannot part with them without inward bleeding, and I do not try to hide from thee the terror of the parting. I come trembling, but I do come. Please root from my heart all those things which I have cherished so long and which have become a very part of my living self, so that thou mayest enter and dwell there without rival. Then shalt thou make the place of thy feet glorious. Then shall my heart have no need of the sun to shine in it, for thyself will be the light of it, and there shall be no night there. In Jesus' name, amen.